Okay, well, thanks everyone. And, and it's good to see you even if it's over Zoom and, and not in person. Uh, I usually get to talk to you guys about Arctic grayling, but today it's a little bit different. We'll be talking about bull trout, which is another fish species that I, I think a lot about and work a lot on um, during my days. And today, what Leslie and I are hoping to do is just uh, get the word out about actually two recovery projects on bull trout that we've been working on near Rocky Mountain House. One is in Rocky Creek and the other one is along the Tay. And those two projects just by themselves I, I find really interesting but they're also good examples of how we're generally approaching native trout recovery projects now in the province with a foundation in science and then a real collaborative kind of um, approach to the on the ground action. Um, and then uh, I'll be starting off, Leslie will take over kind of midway through and she's going to end talking about some volunteer uh, opportunities. And I hope some of them pique your interest because we really do need help, uh, particularly in the Tay, but I'll let Leslie speak more to that. So this presentation is called Bringing Back Bull Trout in the Clearwater River Watershed. And uh, when we think about bull trout, kind of bigger picture, of course, they're listed as threatened under provincial legislation. And just recently in 2019, they were also listed as threatened under the Federal Species at Risk Act. Um, and those would be the populations in the central and southern part of the province. And in the north, they were listed federally as uh, a species of special concern. So fortunately for uh, fisheries managers, people who care about the species recovery, we do have a finer scale understanding of population status than just kind of wide sweeping um, units like that. And that's through the bull trout fish sustainability index, which is like a report card for bull trout. And I think you guys have seen these maps quite a bit. Um, this one I'm showing you is of course bull trout and it's just been color coded here. Green is good, red is bad, black is really bad. Black means that we've lost of the population from that watershed. And just so it um, is easier to understand, in terms of what these colors mean for an angling catch rate. So if you imagine you guys were average anglers, which I don't think you guys are, but let's just pretend you're an average angler and it took you more than two hours to catch a bull trout, that would be likely a very high risk population. But if you could go out and catch uh, more than three bull trout in an hour, that's probably a very low risk population. And that would be the typical experience across a watershed. So not just at your favorite honey hole, but if you kind of dropped a pin on average, that's what you should experience. So it's pretty clear, you know, we don't have a lot of green on this map and the green we do have is in national parks or mostly in protected areas in the pro pro on the province side of things. Um, and there's a lot of red. So we have quite a bit of work to do to recover this species. And there are projects going on up and down the east slopes. But like I said, today, we're gonna to be focusing on two projects that happen to fall uh, within the Clearwater River watershed, which is just uh, west of, of uh, Sundry and, and uh, kind of Caroline Rocky Mountain House area. So if you haven't had the chance yet to visit the Clearwater, I definitely recommend it. It's one of those beautiful kind of foothill freestone type streams, lots of habitat complexity, fun log jams to fish around. Um, I fished it a couple times and I do have to say it's like, I don't know, I can't quite put my finger on it, but it's one of the most dangerous rivers that I've, I've crossed in moderate flows. So if you go out there, take care um, of that and uh, as well, depending on where you are, it can be quite a, quite a walk between holes too. If you look at the satellite imagery from this watershed, it actually does a pretty good job breaking it up into its three big kind of land use zones. So the top end of the watershed here is kind of shown in this white. And this part is generally hard to access. There's not a lot of recreation. There's not a lot of industrial use and the headwaters are actually in Banff National Park. And then in this middle section that's green, we have lots of recreation. So equestrian use, uh, hiking, hunting, camping, uh, backpacking, fishing, that kind of stuff. Uh, we have forestry, we have oil and gas. 
And then down at the bottom here in this kind of brown area, this is the agricultural area and the land has been cleared for crops and, and cattle. And these major zones do um, shape the kind of recovery actions that we need to take. And I'll talk a, a bit more about that in a moment. One of the most important things to do when you're thinking about recovering a population or really for any fisheries management application is make sure that you're anchored in a reasonable baseline condition. And what that means is that you have a good understanding of what you can expect from a population in terms of how many fish or where they are or size of fish. And one real challenge to that is a phenomenon called the shifting baseline. And it impacts fisheries biologists like me and fishermen. And what happens is you set your baseline for a population just based on your own personal observations of that population. So if you just started fishing the clear water, uh, let's say 10 years ago, then maybe you catch you know, a bull trout a day or something, then that's normal for you. And it would, might seem kind of crazy to expect the population to achieve anything else. And so one way to combat that is to look into the historical record and get an, a sense of what this population looked like uh, before there was so many people on the landscape and so many different kinds of industrial and recreational uses. And one part of that historical record are angler interviews. So here's just some uh, snippets from anglers who fished this area in the 40s and 50s. So things uh, like I would catch five or six bull trout in a day. They usually weighed between one and two pounds um, from the Tay River. A friend of ours had caught one so big that the steaks cut off were like slices of bread. Four to five bull trout in every hole. In Rocky Creek, you could catch bull trout 12 to 14 inches on average. It was great fishing. We would just go down and catch all we wanted to for supper. And in Timber Creek, big spawners up to 24 inches in the fall. And then by the 70s, you kind of started hearing more like these kinds of experiences. Uh, by this time, bull trout were only caught in the uppermost three miles and that's Elk Creek, or in a place called Limestone Creek. This creek had already been fished out a lot. There wasn't a lot left for numbers or size. So it's this kind of information and other pieces of historical um, data that we use to set the historic density. And for the Clearwater, we set that at very low risk. And today, it's at high risk. So of course, the question is, well, what happened here? How do we get from very low risk to high risk? What can we do about it to start working our way back to a uh, more sustainable population status? One of the biggest challenges to answering those questions that we've experienced in the recent past is disentangling all of the different factors that are operating on a bull trout population in, um, at the same time. It's called cumulative effects. So, uh, you know, there could be 13, 14, 20 different kinds of potential limiting factors, again, in the same space and time. And if you're not careful, it can be really confusing to disentangle, well, which one threat or couple of threats should we be focusing on to make the biggest difference? And if you don't do that, it can be very overwhelming and you could quite frankly, just waste your time working on threats that actually may not matter the most. And then also having a, a really realistic idea on what that population can achieve in terms of recovery potential, because we obviously can't roll back time to the 1900s. We are here on the landscape. And so what could a population look like if we mitigate the threats that uh, are that it's actually we can we can do something about? We can't you know blow up big dams. Um, but maybe we can reduce sedimentation. So what does that look like? So we and, and our stakeholders have built what we call human effects models to help us answer those questions. And what I'm showing you here is just the front end of the Athabasca rainbow trout model, but we have one for bull trout and one for West Slope cutthroat trout as well. And I'll step you through how, the, uh, how this works using the clear water as an example. So we start with the big threat list for bull trout. And there's something like 16 different threats. 
And it would include things like temperature and phosphorus, competition with brook trout, um, pathogens, uh, all that kind of stuff. And then we run the model with the best available data we have. And at that big watershed scale, it indicates that we think the most important limiting factors are fishing mortality. So that is incidental catch and release mortality and poaching, sedimentation and fragmentation. And if we can mitigate those threats, we think we can move the population from a high risk to a low risk state. Um, and I, I'd just like to point out here again is, even if we mitigate these threats, we don't think we'll get back to that very low risk state. Um, just the low risk state would be the target that we think would be achievable. Uh, the Clearwater is a really big watershed to work at though for recovery. So you can dig a little bit deeper and look at, at a sub-watershed scale. And you don't have to worry too much about the numbers in this table. But um, in case you're curious, I included it here. But uh, we can specifically look at two places. So Rocky Creek, which is called Middle Clearwater River on this table, and the Tay River. And then we can start asking questions about, okay, if this is the most important threat and we mitigate it, what do we think the status would look like in this subwatershed? So I'll start by talking about uh, the Rocky Creek uh, example, and then I'll switch to the Tay. So Rocky Creek um, is at a high risk state right now, the bull trout population. And we think if we just focus on fragmentation, so hanging culverts and that kind of thing, and improve connectivity, it isn't going to change population status. So that would be um, not a very good recovery action plan. If we just focused on decreasing sedimentation, we think we can improve it by one status level to moderate risk. So this would be kind of uh, like single threat approaches. Let's now take a cumulative effects approach. If we improve connectivity and decrease sedimentation, still probably just to moderate risk. Uh, however, if we decrease sedimentation and change fishing regulations, then we might be able to achieve a low risk state. So at this point, the model has taken us as far as it can. It's uh, helped us focus on really two threats, sedimentation, maybe fishing regulations. And now we need to step away from the computer, put our waders on and get out there and validate uh, our thoughts and ideas around the threats. And then also come up with the real plan. What do we need to do? Where? Who's going to do it? What techniques do we use? And then monitor and see, well, did it actually result in a change in bull trout? So when we went out and looked at Rocky Creek, what we found was a serious damage caused by unmanaged off-highway vehicle use. This is just one picture from the watershed. And the damage you know, had to do with the high density of crossings um, and also the fact that there was so much erosion along some of the trails that the uh, water had switched from the main channel into the OHV channel, which was a real problem because as water levels dropped, as winter approached, it was stranding bull trout, and then they would die when, uh, uh, when uh, they froze to ground. So serious problems, and of course, uh, OHV trails, they act like sediment chutes every time it rains. They mobilize those fine sediments, bring them into the creek, and they can cement over eggs, and sedimentation also has serious sublethal effects for bull trout as well. So um, because of this, the severity of the damage out there, this was actually elevated to a provincial level emergency, which allowed us to access uh, funding and support um, that isn't standard for native trout recovery, but was uh, really effective in this case. And we remediated over 31 crossings in about 20 kilometers. And I've just included a map here that shows where all the remediation sites were. And then uh, if you're familiar with the area, Cut it, Rocky Creek is right in between Cutoff and Limestone Creek. 
And when I say we remediated, I really mean like a variety of government staff from many different departments, not just fisheries, and Trout Unlimited volunteers as well. So here's one of our work days uh, where we're planting willows and putting in straw wattle. And uh, this what it was really hard work and we absolutely couldn't have done it without this many people. So that was great. And the kinds of remediation that we do, if you're curious, so here's uh, a before and after picture. So before, here's the standard OHV crossing. Again, every time it rains, all that kind of muddy looking stuff comes into the creek, which is not good for bull trout. And then afterwards, what's built here is a, a double log crib wall. And then behind it, there's uh, sediment soil wraps to build um, that incline back up so that it's flat. And on the top, there is uh, some coconut matting and then grass and willow stakes. And then over time, that will build up that, that bank again. So you don't have that, that uh, raw open shoot going right into the water. And uh, in like looking at this crossing, we probably would have ranked this as a moderate priority crossing. So there were some crossings that were in way worse shape than this and some crossings that also weren't as bad as this. So this is kind of an average case. So in addition to the bio um, remediation that we did, uh, there was also many other kinds of activities that went on. And now between uh, AEP and Trout Unlimited, we go out every year in the spring and we walk it and we make sure that the remediation is staying in place because we have had problems with people and and potentially high water and even you know animals getting in there and ruining some of the remediation. And if there is significant damage, we make plans to go in and fix it usually in the fall. And then we ha also have fisheries surveys. So again, at the end of five years, our intention is to be able to say, hey, yeah, this, uh, this did make a difference for bull trout or no, this kind of uh, big study or big uh, project didn't make a difference. So we've only monitored for three years so far, because we did this project back in 2017, 2018, but I can show you some preliminary data. So along the left here, this is showing bull trout catch rate, and this is electrofishing. And then on the bottom, we have some different watersheds. So we have cutoff elk, limestone, and rocky. Cutoff elk and limestone would, would be considered control watershed. So they're places that we aren't actively trying to recover bull trout in. And then in each one of these watersheds, we have 14 or 15 random sites that we go out and electrofish. And this is showing you the distribution of catch rates at those sites. But what you can focus on is just these thick black bars. And these are the median values, which is kind of like an average value. And here are the Rocky Creek results in three years. So again, it's early, um, but looking promising. And what I didn't mention is we actually have a very similar project going on out in Fall Creek, which is in the Ram drainage right next door, where we've remediated 54 OHV crossings in nine kilometers. And we have a very similar study design there where we have controls. And these are the values so far for that system for bull trout. So we do need it to have a couple more years of monitoring to increase our confidence around trend detection. So right now it'd be really tempting to look at this information and say, hey, bull trout are increasing. We just have to be a little bit cautious and make sure that we are putting in the necessary number of years of monitoring to be confident in that. And then because we ha have controls, then we can ask the next level of question, which is, well, if there is a trend, is that because of natural variation or is that actually be probably because of our remediation? So stay tuned and uh, we'll be wrapping again uh, the monitoring in, in two years for this. So that's the Rocky Creek story. Now I'm gonna shift gears back to the Tay River and get back to that kind of science foundation on how we set up uh, recovery plans. So in the Tay River, which is just downstream of Rocky Creek, the current adult density for bull trout is considered very high risk. If we just improve connectivity, again, doesn't really move the lever there. 
If we decrease sedimentation, we think we can improve to a high risk state. But again, that's um, high risk still means high chance that this, we could lose this population completely in the, in the future. If we improve connectivity and decrease sedimentation, so like a cumulative effects approach, then we think we can improve it to moderate risk. And if we do three things, improve connectivity, decrease sedimentation, and change fishing regulations, we think a low risk population status is possible. So again, this is uh, as far as the model takes us, we've now focused on three big factors in the Tay. We have a, a possible uh, recovery objective, and now we have to get out there and actually validate the model and then come up with the real field level plans on what we're going to do next. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Leslie. Can you hear me now? Okay, I think so. Um, all right, so I am, here we go. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, what we do now. What are we actually going to do in the Tay River watershed to recover bull trout? Um, we've got the model has predicted the things that we should do. Um, so we have to figure out, you know, in real life, what are we gonna do? So we've put together kind of a tactical plan um, with Trout Unlimited Canada and Alberta Environment and Parks. We've got Cows and Fish helping out too. This is kind of a multi-partner plan that we've developed. And what we're trying to do is validate those threats that the model predicted and prioritize the actions that we're gonna to take to address those key threats. Um, we have to do some assessment work to monitor whether or not we're making a difference. And we need to communicate that out to people and, and get folks involved, which is kind of why we're here today doing this. And just to remind you here, this is the Tay in that middle sort of section of the Clearwater River watershed. And we like to think of it as kind of being on the front lines of recovery. Um, this lower reach here, you know, it's a lot more developed and um, not, not as likely to support bull trout anymore, but the Tay River still has bull trout um, and temperatures are good. It still has a heartbeat and uh, bull trout haven't quite given up on that watershed yet. So we're not ready to give up either. <laughs> So one of the, uh, set the risks or threats that the model predicts was sediment and, and water quality. And we know that this is a problem kind of throughout the Eastern slopes, but finding out where all the worst places are is a little bit like looking for a needle in a haystack. Um, and I mean, we know that where you have bare ground um, and when it rains or snows, uh, snow melts, those are areas that that sediment is mobilized and can be delivered into, into water courses. Um, so we use this model that Alberta Agriculture and Forestry and Foothills Research Institute have put together to help us figure out where the worst places are. Um, so the model predicted about 300 or so sites within the Tay River that are likely producing and delivering sediment to the creeks and the tributaries. Um, and then we used our brains to figure out, well, which one of those are like actually probably problems. And then we went out over the last two years and validated 157 of those sites. So we went out with um, human beings in our boots and waders and, and identified which ones are actually the worst of the worst. And now we're in the process of putting together a remediation plan to um, prioritize and, and come up with a plan to actually fix those. Um, so some of these places are roads, you know, unpaved roads. Um, some of them are trails like former cut lines and things like that. And there are some off highway vehicle trails in the watershed. It's not a public land use zone. So there is no formal trail designation system, but we're about 60 to 70% of our way getting through inventorying where all those trails are. And we need to figure out how they're being used so that we can um, prioritize the restoration work and, and figure out what to actually do at those places. We know that riparian areas are really important for protecting and maintaining water quality. So we've had cows and fish go out and uh, conduct 10 riparian health inventories throughout the watershed. And most of the watershed is um, public land. 
And the, the sites that they selected to do the inventories were closely associated with the electrofishing sites that were, were completed. I'll talk a little bit about that later. And two of them were on private land. The good news is that the um, riparian health inventories actually scored pretty good. Um, there's pretty good native plant communities, pretty good riparian cover. And in fact, um, the overall watershed scored better than the provincial average. So we don't think that riparian health is a huge limiting uh, factor throughout the watershed. But we do know that there were some areas that are problematic. Um, and one of those being the, the Tay River campground uh, just west of Caroline. So one of the first initiatives that we did when we started working in the Tay watershed was conduct a couple of volunteer work days and did some bioengineering right at the campground, actually along most of the shoreline along the campground. And um, so this was early, so I guess June 2019. And um, we had some volunteers, some folks from the Central Alberta chapter and, and a corporate uh, volunteer group from Plains Midstream came out. We built a wattle fences and planted willows and transplanted trees. And um, so this is a site we're looking at here where these folks are planting willows. And um, a year later, it was looking pretty darn good. So we're, um, this is a, a great place to plant willows. So, well, at least it has been the last couple of years because it's been quite wet. And, um, the willows have taken really, really well. So we definitely know there's some ways to recover those damaged riparian areas. We were also curious about other water quality issues. Um, there are some pipeline crossings in the watershed. Um, so we just wanted to rule out whether or not there were maybe some other pollutants that might be causing problems. And this isn't something we typically do like um, water quality monitoring like this, but we did sample four sites last September, looking at heavy metals and salts and hydrocarbons and a really full suite of, um, of parameters. And thankfully, no red flags came out of that. Um, everything looks okay and within sort of the, what, what would be expected and um, probably nothing that's, that's uh, limiting bull trout that we can detect. And water temperature, obviously, you folks with the Northern Lights fly fishers are pretty well versed in this. You've been doing water temperature monitoring in the Pembina for quite some time. Um, we know that water temperature is a really big influence on the fish population and, and distribution and um, bull trout are really sensitive to, to water temperature. So we wanted to make sure, is this place good enough for bull trout? Um, temperature is a really hard thing for us to change and um, you know, we, we just wanted to make sure that we're on the right track. So over the last few years, we've had 11 temperature loggers out in the watershed. Most of them are just there for the open water season, but we have left a few over winter as well. And um, yeah, all of the sites um, for most of the season is within the acceptable range for bull trout, which is good news. Um, certainly there are a few places that might get a little warmer during some, some parts of the summer, but I, d I don't think that this is a, a major limiting factor preventing bull trout, which is good because um, we know that there's still some really great cold water in the system. And uh, the next step we wanna do with temperature and, and kind of helping us learn a little bit more about the system and groundwater influence is a flight. And so we're actually looking at um, maybe even this week, doing a, a flight over the Tay, a flyover, and um, identify whether there's some open water pockets, and that might help us identify groundwater influence, which would show us where some of that spawning areas might be. And I can happily report we actually did that today, Leslie. Oh, great! <laughs> yeah, so we had a, a crew fly out and uh, do videography over the Tay, uh, and it was a little chilly, but they got out and got it done, so Good. <laughs> great. That's great, great news. Um, so fragmentation and connectivity was another of the threats that the model predicted. So we want to get a sense of where these, uh, where these barriers to fish passage might be. And over the past few years, we've assessed, I think, most of the stream crossings in the watershed. And um, there's certainly some barriers to fish movement. But the next step is to really prioritize that work because, you know, um, there could be a, a major highway crossing with, um, you know, big 
serious work to replace a, a culvert or a bridge. Um, but we have to ask ourselves, is that going to make a difference for bull trout? Is that on a tributary that bull trout are using or, or not? Um, so we'll, we'll have to figure that out. Um, but we've got, I think, the data, you know, we're collecting that data to make those decisions. Um, but there, there are some good things happening. Uh, Sundry Forest Products has, um, they've also been working on their own stream crossing assessments as well. And the pictures on the bottom show an example of a culvert, culverted crossing that was replaced with an open span bridge a couple of years ago. And um, Kelsey, who I know is on the call, is right here. <laughs> and, uh, and Kelsey was uh, responsible for getting this project done. So it's really nice to see the local operators uh, getting, getting work done on the ground as well. Um, my slide advancing here. Hmm. Here we go. So how are we going to tell if we're actually making a difference? And um, electrofishing is a tool that we frequently use to um, get the you know marks on the report card to see how the fish are doing. Um, and it was influential in helping us decide that we're even going to do work in the Tay River. So in 2017, AEP sampled a couple of sites on the Tay as part of a broader Clearwater River sampling program and one bull trout was detected. So, you know, at that point we knew, hey, there is still some, some life here in the watershed and maybe there's some opportunity for recovery. Um, so in 2019, a much more intensive sampling program was implemented in the Tay that those 15 sites um, throughout the watershed. And unfortunately no bull trout were detected um, in that system or in that year. And last year, we were only able to sample three sites, um, some different little tributaries that hadn't been sampled before. And again, <laughs> unfortunately, we did not detect any bull trout. Um, but we did have reports from anglers, actually some members from Central Alberta chapter that had been helping out with the willow staking work that we did earlier in 2019. And so they were aware that we were working in the watershed, trying to recover bull trout and, and reported to us that they caught some pretty good size bull trout um, in fall of 2019 near the campground. So we thought, well, hey, maybe there's, um, maybe they're using this as a migratory, um, the a migratory population is still using this system. Um, and now we're employing another tool <laughs> to detect bull trout. Um, so the University of Calgary is, is working with us uh, to collect eDNA, which is environmental DNA. And this is part of a broader research project that the U of C is doing. Um, and thankfully they are including the Clearwater and specifically the Tay in their research. So they sampled 17 sites last year in September, October. And this is a really cool technology that really just involves collecting a water sample, running it through a filter. And then if there's any little bits of DNA that are in that water sample, it will be left on that filter and then through the analysis can detect whether or not that species that you're looking for is present in the sample. So pretty cool technology and um, allows us to get to lots of places in a relatively short amount of time and detect uh, whether or not the species may have, have been there. So thankfully the UFC has got the funding to carry out that sampling again two more times this year in 2021. Um, which will be great because we'll be able to look at a couple of different seasonal differences too. Um, and yeah, and unfortunately we don't have the results yet from the, from the sampling last year, but it's being completed. The analysis is being done at the U of A in Edmonton and um, should be in a few weeks or you know, maybe, maybe a month or two, we should have the results from that. And a big part of our program this past year was running a fish trap. Um, so I mentioned that the anglers, some of our members had, had reported catching some larger bull trout in, near the campground. And uh, so we got us really thinking about this spawning run and we wanted to validate um, whether or not there is a, a bull trout spawning run up the Tay. So we ran this bi-directional fish trap um, from mid-August to mid-October and um, we, we tagged all of the salmonids with pit tags and um, collected tissue samples from bull trout. And those tissue samples are being analyzed um, 
right now to determine um, sex markers. So they'll tell us if, the, if those fish were male or female, and they'll be able to tell us if those fish have any hybridization with brook trout. And these are things that will help us um, just understand the population structure a little bit better and potentially inform other future recovery efforts. Um, so yeah, we caught nine bull trout. Um, and there was a couple of ripe females and, and at least one ripe male. And one of those females, at least um, when she moved back downstream, had been spent. So, she, you know, which suggests she laid her eggs somewhere in the watershed. So we're really hopeful that, um, that there is some spawning activity going on. And what we're planning on doing in 2021 this year is setting up some monitoring arrays so that we can figure out where those tagged bull trout are moving in the watershed. So I mentioned the importance of those angler reports that really helped influence our programming in the, in the watershed this summer. So we set up a hotline and um, encouraging folks that are fishing the Tay River to report whether they're catching bull trout. We, want, we would really like to know where and when and roughly how big those fish are that they might be catching in the Tay. So we put up uh, some signage and we even put up posters in the community. Um, asking folks to report their catch to us, which would be really helpful information. And uh, we're just trying to get the word out about the overall program. So we've been doing some presentations to other groups like you guys. And um, this was featured in one of some of the um, AEP fisheries engagement webinars a few weeks ago. Um, the volunteer work days, articles, social media, that kind of thing, just to get the word out and get people involved. Um, we'd really like this, uh, you know, I think the Northern Lights fly fishers, you guys have really set the bar high in terms of how a, you know, volunteer group can be so involved in recovering a species in a watershed. And um, I would just, you know, really like to use that model to get, get folks working on the Tay as well. And if you haven't seen it, Michael Short came out last year to do a Let's Go Outdoors video on the, on the partnership and on the project. So, if you haven't seen that yet, I would definitely encourage you to check out the Let's Go Outdoors YouTube channel or Facebook and um, look for that Tay River video. It's pretty good. So next steps um, this year, um, again, we, we're going to go back to that tactical plan, um, update it with what we've learned last year, make any adjustments or changes in terms of what we want to carry out and accomplish this year. Um, and like Jess mentioned, we were, we're definitely planning some volunteer opportunities this spring. We were kind of limited last year in the volunteer opportunities, although we did have some people help out with the trap, trap duties. Um, but, uh, you know, the COVID thing put so much uncertainty into our volunteer programming, um, and we had a bit of a late start. But this year we're going to go gung-ho, and um, we, we want to have some... Um, couple of work days in the spring to do some angling and more pit tagging. So we'd love to have you folks come out, um, we're thinking April, May, and see if we can catch some bull trout if there's any hanging around the lower tay and implant some pit tags. We'd love to have folks help with array monitoring. Um, that'll be later in the summer and, and fall. And um, that'll be, you know, pretty, pretty regular stuff. And I know some of you guys with Northern Lights have done that. And, We'd like to get Central Alberta chapter uh, involved in those kind of things too. We'll be doing some stream and riparian restoration. And as I mentioned, we're still kind of figuring out that work plan. So we don't have dates or specific locations set for that, but that, that's definitely coming. And then based on the results from the um, arrays and from the eDNA surveys, that is hopefully gonna point us in the right direction of where some spawning might be occurring uh, so that we can carry out some red surveys in the fall as well and identify some actual bull trout spawning activity. And that's always a great volunteer activity too. One of my favorite things actually just walking a creek in September and looking for fish. <laughs> um, so the other the other threat if you recall that the model predicted was um, was uh, mortality and so we uh, we know now that there is this bull trout spawning run and uh, AEP is actually proposing a fall spawning closure in the in the Tay to protect that spawning run. Those 
those fish are just so vulnerable when they're moving in. The water is really clear and, and low and it's super accessible. And um, so this is something that's being proposed to protect that, that spawning run, um, just because there's so few of them. And I think if we lose one or two fish from accidental mortality, obviously no one wants to kill a bull trout, um, but we, we just think the risk is, is pretty high. So we wanna protect those spawners from getting up there. And yeah, just to summarize, um, the Tay River here is a really good example of a complicated situation without that smoking gun um, that we can just fix one thing and everything's gonna be fine. Uh, so we're using science, the scientific tools that are available to us to figure out where things likely used to be and what is realistic. I mean, we know we can't fix everything everywhere and uh, we're not gonna learn everything there is to know about the Tay River watershed but we have to just get enough information that we can carry out some actions and monitor what we're doing to make you know, us understand whether we're, we're making a difference. Um, this project is too much for one agency to do on its own, which is why we've got this really great partnership. And um, each agency, each organization can really play to our own strengths. And um, uh, I think can, we can accomplish more together which is also a really good pilot, I think, for addressing cumulative impacts on a, on a watershed scale. And um, we'd really like to see this kind of approach taken in other watersheds throughout the Eastern Slopes. Um, because, uh, well, we'll see if it works, <laughs> but I'm, I am hopeful that it will. And so far things have gone really well. And um, in terms of how, how we've been able to work together and how much we've been able to accomplish so far, um, so the real test will be in, in what happens to the bull trout. So with that, I think we'll, um, Jess and I are both able to take questions. Well, I'll kick off the next question. The, uh, I'm, I'm curious about the funding. Where, where are you finding funding for all of these various activities? A lot of those remediation projects are gonna be very expensive. Uh, uh, where's the money coming from to do all that? Yeah, work? good question, Ken. And uh, yeah, I forgot to mention that. So we did get um, a big chunk of funding from the provincial government through the Watershed Resiliency and Restoration Fund, um, WRRP. Um, this was a fund that was created shortly after the 2013 flood as a way to build resiliency and, and um, uh, promote watershed scale restoration in Alberta to, you know, mitigate the effects of flood and drought. Um, so we did get uh, quite a bit of support from that program. Um, we've also had some some grants from ACA and um, uh, oh, and through the the provincial, we have a, a native trout collaborative that we um, are working with the province and other partners, ACA. Cows and Fish, um, Sea Paws, and Foothills Research Institute. And um, this, the collaborative has received quite a bit of funding from DFO through the Nature Legacy Fund. And so some of that uh, funding has, has come down towards us for this project as well. Great, thank you. Yep. I, I was wondering if um, if there, in, in North America, if there's any, any models out there that have data for for a longer period of time, and, and well, what could you, you expect from from your your, your models? What, what when what time frame frame do you need to know? Uh, you have a result you, you can try trust? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so the rate of recovery is based on lots of different factors. The two that come to mind is the scale or how impactful your management action is, and then your starting point for your population. So if you're able to do a really big project like Rocky Creek, big scale, big meaningful scale, then you'll see faster recovery. Um, then if, you know, your, your hands are a little bit more tied and you do, let's say, a couple willow staking projects, say. Um, also, when you're starting from such low population numbers, it does 
just take time for numbers to accumulate, right? For those fish to spawn, grow, and then uh, spawn themselves. So for bull trout, um, we've had, unfortunately, few places in the province where, where we've monitored a recovery, but one place is Lower Kananaskis Lakes. And in that situation, we went from an estimate, an estimate of like 60 fish to 1,000 fish in a, in a 10 year period. Uh, the lever there was a little bit different. It had more to do with um, reducing fishing mortality, but still it does show you um, how quickly a bull trout population can respond. Um, if you look at a place like Rocky Creek there, where we're doing habitat remediation, so the response might be uh, seen first in how many juvenile fish we have, um, we could likely detect a, a a 30% change in the population within five years. And that would be like one status increase in the FSI, if that makes sense. Um, now, if you don't mind looking outside bull trout and start thinking more about salmon recovery or rainbow trout recovery, there's lots of other kinds of examples and types of remediation projects that you know BC and Montana have done. And they really, it really ranges in the rate because every watershed is so different. And again, that scale of management is different. But from what we've seen, like if we get it right, if we really get the action right, then we should be able to detect a change within you know, five years of monitoring, maybe not full population recovery, but start detecting that, that positive trend. Um, and learning more about the rate of recovery too is part of this whole project because again, we don't have a lot of experience recovering bull trout here in the province. So being mindful and setting up studies like how we're approaching the Tay and Rocky Creek is really good because we can learn from those studies and then in the future have a better understanding of the rate of recovery. So it's not a perfect answer, um, unfortunately, but uh, um, Hopefully that gives you kind of a bit of a sense of recovery potential. Again, just looking at the Lower K Lake example. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, Jessica, how did you lower the numbers in uh, Lower Kananaska? What was the mortality tool that you used? Uh, so Lower Kananaska Lake, if I recall correctly, this is kind of before my time. So it was open to bull trout um, harvest. And there was a complete closure of a spawning tributary. And then I think it flipped a catch and release and maybe a bait ban. But what that did was actually reduce angling effort by a significant proportion as well. So not only did you have less harvest, I can't remember the exact numbers, but there was a, a significant decrease in the number of people going to use that fishery because at the time, if you couldn't harvest a fish, then folks would go elsewhere to harvest a fish. So it was kind of a double wham, a triple whammy with a spawning tributary closure, uh, lower angling effort, and the uh, change from harvest to catch and release. So that was, a, yeah, that was quite a while ago now. Did that put pressure on other water sources for fishermen? I, uh, again, I'm, I'm not sure. I don't know if there was a monitoring program set up back then to detect that and where those, where those anglers ended up going. I don't know. Hi, Jessica, it's Dean here. Um, I'm just interested, like in your previous slides, you talked about connectivity and that if you increase connectivity, it wouldn't really have much of an impact. Is that in reference to the dams that are on that stream? Because I know that like growing up around there, we never fished it very much because it was such a quagmire to get into, um, just dam after dam. Is it still like that? Yeah, so you're, so um, how we've kept, uh, captured connectivity in this case has to do more with road crossings, not uh, beaver impoundments, which is what I think you're talking about, right, Dean? Yeah. Yeah, so in the case of, of Rocky Creek and the Tay, um, it, road crossings and connectivity issues weren't coming out as a really big problem. And likely yeah. it's because there aren't that many road crossings compared to other watersheds. Like there's certainly other sub watersheds where it comes out as a, as a main major threat, like the Burland is, is one of those places. Um, in terms of the beaver story, um, I've heard anecdotally, you know, 10 years ago and and further back 
that there was a ton of beaver activity on the Tay and uh, <laughs> right, like lots of, uh, and, and even today when you do flyovers, you can see like the old beaver dams, right? Sure. Um, but now, like when we go back, we've flown the, the main channel a couple times and Great. almost all those impoundments have been opened up. Um, there's still, of course, beaver activity going on, but I think, I think the beaver story has really changed in the Tay over the past decade, decade or so. And it's really hard to know how that level of beaver activity maybe played into losing the bull trout in the Tay. Um, maybe it was a perfect trifecta, you know, it was, there's construction of one of the major highways and then major beaver impoundments. And together, those things were just enough to tip bull trout over the edge. I'm not sure, but today, I think it does look different than it did a, from what I hear from a couple, uh, uh, like in the past decades. Does that line up with what you've heard too, Leslie? Yeah, it does. Yeah. Yeah. So you would say that the connectivity between beaver dams is probably reasonably good right now. Yeah, like, I, there's not a lot of dams and you should be able to, the fish should have access to most of the stream. I, again, yeah, we've flown the main, the main stem now a couple times and there's no major features that I would point to and say that's a significant barrier on the main stem. Again, there is beaver activity going on in a couple of the tributaries. And so it'll be interesting when we go out next season and we put those arrays up. And if we detect those big bulls moving up those systems and then kind of reaching that blockage and not being able to push past, that's when we'll start really thinking about um, impacts of beavers again. So most of the stream though is fairly low gradient, right? Especially in the bottom end. Yeah, yeah. but there's kind of like the middle and the top end. It's not, it's kind of like the Tay is kind of right on that edge, right? Of foothills, prairies, so. Yeah, did it match up? Like I know that Andy had done a study a number of years ago about predictors of bull trout present with um, temperature and gradient. So it would fall below, like it would have a lower gradient than what he was um, looking at as a predictor of bull trout presence, right? Uh, you know, most of the recent literature I've seen on bull trout, it points so strongly to temperature being the major predictor. The main thing. Yeah, almost everything else falls aside and, and gradient and temperature are, are so are so correlated as well. So it's a little bit confounded. And so that's why when we put the temperature loggers out and found like majority of that watershed is, is cold enough for bull trout that, that made us feel very optimistic. Like why, why aren't they there? If it was hot, you know, if the majority of the watershed again, we were seeing temperatures of 16 or 17 degrees, then yeah. this wouldn't be a good, a good place to work for bull trout. We'd have yeah. to what is, what's the there. rest of the fish population like up there? Is it like mostly browns or is it, is there a lot of brookies too? Uh, there's browns, brook trout, suckers, um, mountain whitefish, burbot. I think that's kind of, is that all we've, oh, sculpin too. We've caught some sculpin yeah. there. Yep. And so brook trout, it's interesting because most people know the Tay as a brook trout, brown trout fishery. And what we've noticed through our electrofishing, again, we put out, you know, 15 random sites and go and electrofish, is that on average, the brook trout catch rates are significantly lower than in other creeks. There are pockets, though, where brook trout densities are, are higher. And so if those pockets are overlapping, like the last spawning grounds, then we'll have to think about some recovery actions related to brook trout. But at a big picture scale, it's, it's not coming out as a significant limiting factor for bull trout. But again, fine scale data will, will really help us understand that better. But is not brook trout related to the beaver dams that were there in the past? Like the most of the places I, 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 I used to fish and there was brook trout everywhere. There was all kinds of beaver dams. There's no beaver dams and brook trout disappeared with it. And it didn't matter if it was Chambers Creek or, you know, uh, wherever it was. And, you know, and certainly the Tay was a good example of lots of brookies because of beaver dams. They were gone, so the brookies go with them. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm, 
we don't right. have like really long-term data sets for the Tay, so it's hard to know if brook trout densities have all, you know also been marching down when the dams blew out in well, brook, whenever brook that happened. Water down everywhere in the watershed western in western Alberta here. Yeah, and yeah, and just to, so you kind of understand when I say you know on average there's not that many brook trout compared to other creeks is um, when we electrofished. And again, I'd have to check my numbers, but on average, we would catch, you know, like 10 brook trout per 300 meters uh, in the Tay. And again, that's on average, some places would be higher. If you take a creek like Yarra Creek, which is in the Red Deer drainage, um, that's like 300 brook trout per 300 meters. Like that's really high density compared to a place like the Tay. So just to contextualize it, what I mean when I say low versus high densities, and it's really when, like we're really trying to be careful with the assumption when you see a brook trout in a watershed, it doesn't necessarily mean it is competing with bull trout. Like something has to be limiting for there to be competition to occur. Yeah. So. With the with the few number of bull trout you're catching there, what would you consider to be like? You've only got what over three years. Uh, you've caught ten. Is oh, so we caught I nine. We, nine in one year and, and one or two in another year and 11. So we caught nine migratory bull trout that right. were kind of moving around the spawning season. Right. And then in the past, oh, decade or so, we've caught, I would say, like maybe a half dozen throughout the summer. So we don't well, know if those are juvenile fish that are coming from this remnant spawning population. Yeah if they're fish juveniles that are moving in from the system and just feeding there, we're, we're not sure. We've also heard some anecdotes of um, a tributary somewhere where an angler was catching a lot of bull trout and it's an angler who uh, would likely be identifying them correctly, but we haven't found that tributary yet. So that's, that's really piqued our interest as well. And maybe the eDNA will help us find that spot. But. What I'm wondering about, Jessica, and, and with so many problems that exist in the fisheries in Alberta, and I, I recognize that bull trout are all nice, and, and I'm, Tony's going to probably chase me down and beat on me for a while, but the reality is, the reality is, if that's how few number of fish you're catching, is it worthwhile to spend the money where you actually will get a return? Like, you're spending a huge amount of volunteer effort and, and cash where something it doesn't appear like there's a real big possibility of success. There's so few there now. Maybe we should take a look at streams that have a greater chance of success on that one. Well, I think that's where, like right now, when we work on recovery projects, the Tay is kind of right on the nice edge. Like yeah, there's is. there's few fish left, but the temperature is it looks so good in the Tay that it, it again makes us feel Maybe very Maybe there's another contributing factor, the reason they're not there. Well, that's what gotta we're- got to be something. Yeah, and that's what we're really working hard um, to look at. And, and it could be as, what would be really nice is it could be as simple as the, the spawning tributary that's left, there's a huge sediment source right there, right? So those two big females that were ripe yeah. went and laid their eggs there and just every year they just get covered with this wall of sediment. That would be an ideal situation, but we don't know that yet. Um, so I am optimistic, like, I, and again, it was because we caught those big right females, they carry about 5,000 eggs each. Yeah. So even though there's few fish, they still, there's some reproductive potential there. But, but is it not possible that those bull trout, and I hate to point out this, but one of the things I find about fish, they occasionally get lost. Uh, and what I mean by that, I found cutthroat well up Prairie Creek, not somewhere you would expect to find cutthroat. And, uh, and so it, it would seem like populations move around. And this is potentially what you saw there, is two fish that would have normally not been there and just happened to be there when we were. Yeah. You, I, actually, it's, it's good, hard to know. Well, actually, that's a... That's a really good point, Don, and it, that's actually really exciting because we don't know if we've completely lost the Tay population, that's right. and those are the fish that are actually recolonizing it. That's the rescue effect from the rest rest of the Clearwater. Is that a population? Um, yeah, and we don't we don't know that yet. And from a recovery potential, 
uh, it doesn't it doesn't really matter because we know there are spawning fish moving into that system if they are the original taste stock or if they are the rescuers from the upstream um, watershed regardless they're coming in and coming in to lay their eggs so what we're hoping is when we find out where those fish are going through combination of eDNA the flight we did today to look where groundwater is red surveys the arrays we can really figure out you know, are there a couple issues in the, a key tributary? And if we fix them, will we see that population come back? And if not, then we can look into some plan Bs, which could be something like recovery stocking. Um, and that would be way in the future. And we'd have to talk about the trade-offs of that too. But I think the reality is if we don't dig into a couple of these kinds of watersheds, we'll just slowly lose the, the species. There's no question that bull trout are in trouble. Yeah. Yeah. Two, one more question. Uh, I noticed that quads never got treated with the disdain that most of us feel for them. <laughs> uh, what are you guys going to do about training those people? Are you going to well, hand out targets or put on their backs or something? <laughs> well, we're trying actually in the Tay. We've um, um, reaching out to the Rocky ATV Club. And um, we've actually set a date, I think in September to work with them and do a bit of a, like a tour and a field day and do some restoration and talk about, um, you know, crossing assessment tools and, and things like that to get them involved. And, you know, they're keen on doing positive work. Um, so we're gonna try and capitalize on that. But, but and, let's say uh, there's, there's 20 odd thousand quads go through Rocky on a long weekend. Yeah. You know, like, like it's one ugly pot liquor out here, you know, and yeah, it ain't and getting better. For sure. And that's the challenge. And um, yeah. And especially because, yeah, there's no designated trail system in the Tay. So it makes it even more difficult to manage. Even if there was, you can't keep them on it. Like these are cowboys. <laughs> yeah. And so we've, uh, so Rocky Creek and Fall Creek, very similar situation as the Tay. Yeah. So it's outside yeah. of the outside of a public land use zone. Um, so we've done a combination there of education and enforcement, and and education enforcement and a commitment to monitoring and maintaining the engineering out there. And and so far that's working. Um, but you're right. Like at a big scale, it's extremely overwhelming. The sheer it number is, of unmanaged unmanaged OHV use but you know from a practitioner's level like um, from for us trying to recover we're just starting small in a watershed let's see if we can make a difference and and recover uh, you know recover one population and even that would be a huge win in the province is recovering one river population of bull trout one watershed yeah. so kind of eat the elephant that way because I think it could be if you start kind of like you, ha you need to, you do need to keep the big picture in mind. But if you get crushed down by it to the point where you you can't even move forward and you lose uh, momentum and enthusiasm for these kind of projects, then I think bull trout will be in even more trouble. There's a question from uh, from Evan about the eDNA, and uh, he's wondering if there's any results or any early results that indicate the presence of uh, bull trout in the Tay River or elsewhere in the watershed. So uh, good question, Evan, but the answer is no, not yet. Um, we were hoping to have results by now, but um, I think the analysis was just a little bit delayed or a little bit behind. But we'll hopefully in the next few weeks, we'll have some results on whether or not any bull trout were detected from those 17 sample sites along the Tay. Um, and I'll, really we'll let you know what we find. <laughs> Lester, is there any potential for doing that on a, on a much larger scale? Oh, totally. Um, this is this is a relatively new technique, and the work that the UFC is doing. Actually, Jess, you might be able to speak a bit more to it, but they are looking at, um, I think, a province-wide project, and I think they're looking at, um, you know, using eDNA and correlating that with water temperature modeling to help predict where bull trout might might be. To, you know, make those predictions all along the eastern slopes. So there's totally potential for that in 
in, in a broader landscape. They've been using eDNA a lot in the in the United States over the last number of years. And it's kind of a good like rapid assessment, hit a whole bunch of places, and then you can just decide, okay, well, it looks like, you know, all of these these six tributaries that we've never sampled, we've never electrofished before, but bull trout are being picked up in the eDNA. So maybe we want to go and electrofish now and get a little bit more information, that kind of thing. You'd prioritize your opportunities really quickly, wouldn't exactly. you? Exactly. Yeah. It's a great tool for that. Yeah. What about the other streams out here, uh, Elk Creek, uh, Pepper's Creek, and streams like that? Are, are those potential for the same kind of thing as those ones up on the Clearwater? The other Clearwater ones are being done? Yeah, so we um, uh, we had some assessment work done, some habitat assessment work done on elk, peppers, and Radiant Creek a couple of years ago. Uh -huh. And just in the lower parts of those of those creeks um, with some, you know, just, you know, what what is the situation like? Is there some restoration opportunities? And we definitely ha had some um, sites recommended to do some restoration work. So at Radiant Creek last year, we did some bioengineering on the lower part, like just below downstream of the tr where the trunk road crosses Radiant Creek. And uh, we're working with the allotment holder there. Um, we installed a exclusionary fencing um, last fall, and we're going to keep that up for at least five years. And we, we're trying to exclude cattle and <laughs> horses from that system for a period of time and let that system recover. Um, we did some willow planting and introduced some woody debris to the system. And we have plans to do a little bit more of that work next year. And cows and fish did some riparian health assessments within the area that we're working and, and a reference reach as well. So we'll be able to monitor um, whether or not there's a response in the, in the health of the creek and the riparian area. And there's there's opportunity, I think, in Elk Creek for, for similar um, similar work. It's the same allotment holder that um, that manages the, the grazing in that Elk Creek compartment as well. Um, so we're starting small with Radiant Creek, and we'll see how that goes and if there's an appetite to do some, you know, grazing management, exclusion fencing, um, restoration work in Elk Creek as well. Hmm. And at Peppers, I should mention too, since you brought that up, um, there there was an off-highway vehicle trail there that um, was kind of in really, really rough shape and likely causing some sedimentation issues and habitat problems. And um, this it's now been closed for summer use. So that part actually is within a public land use zone and there are management tools to be able to manage recreation and use there. So it's now closed for summer use because the trail is just so terrible. And I don't think that there's a really great option for rerouting the trail at, um, in that part of Peppers. Um, but we, we're gonna look at some restoration opportunities if considering that it's not gonna be used in summer, we might be able to speed up the rest of the uh, recovery there as well. There used to be a lot of bull trout in the top end of Peppers and I noticed over the last few years, they've dropped right off. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, even above the fifth bridge, there was a fair number of bulls and they're, they're go mostly gone now. Yeah, we went in and electrofished a couple sites and we're happy to ha still be catching bull trout there, but that is one system where brook trout densities are really high. So we'd have to really think of think it through if if a fix like a sedimentation fix alone would would make a difference because that that is a place where yeah, brook trout densities might might indicate some issues with competition. You're catching there. brook trout in in Elk Creek. Elk Creek for sure, but Pepper's Creek as well. Oh yeah, Pepper's Creek, yeah, okay. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So with that uh, eDNA testing is, and uh, you're keying in on the uh, on the bull trout, um, if you were to go after like different species, do you have to do a different setup for that? Or? Uh, no, so if the researcher is interested in other species, she can use the exact same uh, like a water sample, she would just have to use uh, some different ingredients in the lab called primers. So it would look at, um, so let's say if you're curious about brook trout, brown trout, and bull trout, they would look at a little bit different place in the genome of each of those critters, and they would use what they call different primers. So 
you would only get a hit or a detection in your water sample if brown trout were present. And that same primer wouldn't um, produce a signal if there was only bull trout, for example. But it's kind of up to the researcher and I'm not sure what, what other species she might be looking at besides bull trout. I think she's only focusing right now on bull trout. She's looking at uh, things in and around the Tay, and then she's also got some sites out in the, in the Yukon Territory. Yeah, so it might be bull trout specific, but it is possible again to look at multiple species uh, if the if the research question is. A yeah, so you'd really question. have to focus in what what species you're looking at. Though. Jessica, isn't it also possible to uh, figure out family relationships? Uh, which um, strain goes into what, what uh, tributary and how much the mix, mix pulls up? I'm not sure. I don't know if eDNA would tell you that yet. I think eDNA, you know, would definitely tell you if, a, if an animal is present there or not. Um, for that question, you'd use like other kinds of genetic tools um, that, uh, you know, like microsatellites or something called a SNP. And yeah. Leslie mentioned we sent... Uh, those bull trout samples down to University of Montana. So they'll be looked at using what's called a, a SNP panel. And from that, we'll be able to sex those fish. And then if we included um, other fish from across the clear water, we can ask questions like, are those fish really highly related to fish from Elk Creek? And they are the, the rescuers, like what Don brought up, or is this like a totally unique strain and these are the original remaining taste stock? We haven't done that yet, but we absolutely could ask those kinds of questions. Yeah, it'd be good to know just how much fidelity there is to spawning stream. Absolutely, and yeah. and if we have to go into Plan B, and again, there'd be lots, many more conversations before we we would do recovery stocking. But part of that would have a far more in-depth knowledge of the gen of genetic structures and appropriate um, donor stocks and the hybridization threat too, um, which genetics can obviously help under us understand too. No doubt there's better stuff coming in years to come. A couple of questions for you, Leslie. Um, first of all, good, good talk, uh, ladies. Um, uh, one of the things that I was curious about is, is uh, the one female that went upstream through the fence and then came back down. She had spawned out. Uh, what was the uh, return period? That's a good question, Corey, and I don't know off the top of my head. I don't know if you have that, Jess. I, I don't. It would have been uh, within a span of weeks. Yeah. I don't have that at my fingertips, but we didn't start catching bulls until mid-September, and we pulled the trap mid-October, and we caught her on the upswing, and we caught her swimming down. So it would have been kind of in that time frame. And the other right female we caught going up and never saw again. So... We don't know what happened to that fish. We always like to think she was still busy, you know, up there spotting and we just had yeah, to keep moving down yet. But she's busy. She wasn't she wasn't eaten by a grizzly. Yeah. And and actually what's interesting too is one of those fish we caught, uh, we caught it moving down, which meant it had been in the watershed before we put the trap in, um, hanging out up there. So there there are bull trout up there moving, they're just so rare that it's it's hard for us to detect with electrofishing. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the other things I was curious about, uh, I know we were talking about the ATV crossings, but there's the, the snowmobile club, uh, the Caroline Club. And I wondered whether or not those uh, users might be having a little bit more of an impact because they they can get into the, the lower reach a lot easier than ATVs could. And if they're trying to go up and down the banks, um, with those high powered machines and the big paddles, they could rip up the, the banks pretty quick. Kelsey, I don't know if, if you see a lot of snowmobile users on the landscape when you're out there. You, you might be able to see that on the aerial survey too, right? Yeah, actually the footage that we took today might help, maybe depending on when like the last snowfall happened, but it might help us get a better sense of snowmobile use out there too. Yeah, because certainly some of the trails that we went on and were following, I mean, there was, you know, there was signage for snowmobiles and we used the snowmobile staging area at one point as well, so. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. 
Um, and then my third question here is, since you've only got, say, nine fish moving through that you're able to, uh, to look at, what about considering um, radial telemetry as a, as a means to kind of get a, a bigger snapshot as opposed to, um, you know, tagging a bunch of the fish, the, the arrays depend so much on having a basic understanding of where those, those fish might be going. Um, you need a lot of arrays to kind of really figure out where those fish are going to, to go, which tributaries they might be using. Um, and again, with, you know, only nine fish, something like telemetry might give you a little bit more bang for your buck. Yeah, that's a, definitely something we talked about when we decided how we were going to answer this question of, is there a spawning run? How many fish are moving up here? Where are they going? And we definitely talked about telemetry and considered that. Um, but when we considered the, you know, larger larger size of the equipment that you're implanting on those fish and um, the risk and potentially higher mortality rate in, in implanting those radio tags. So yeah, we decided yeah. to go with the, with the pit tags for that reason, just because of the, the risk. Yeah, there is, there is obviously that to consider. And if you are only getting nine, then. <laughs> yeah, and we didn't know, we had no idea how many we would catch either. Yeah. Yeah, so the trade-off we kind of made was lower risk kind of research methodology, way more arrays next year, guided by where we see groundwater actually. But uh, yeah, you're absolutely right, Corey. It's, that's a uh, few fish and we hope we see them again. And uh, yeah. actually that's another a good shout out too to the spring angling that we hope to do and uh, potentially get some more tags into that system. Bull trout are alternate or can be alternate um, spawning um, or exhibit alternate spawning behavior. So um, if we can tag more fish and that fish happens to move, you know, in 2021 that it didn't move in 2020, that'll, that'll up our chance of detecting it. And then one of the other trade-offs that we talked about was using larger pit tags in the bull trout. Um, typically in Alberta, we use like 12 millimeter pit tags, which you Northern lighters are probably used to seeing. In the big bulls in this project though, we use 23 millimeter pit tags and that just increases our detection probability. So more arrays, bigger tags, bigger chance that we'll, we'll detect yeah. these fish if they move. That was gonna be my other question is what size tags, uh, pit tags were used because as Ken knows, <laughs> some, and, and sometimes it's, uh, it's really tricky to pick up the smaller ones. Yep. Yeah, so we use 23 millimeter uh, in, the, in the bulls and then, for the rest of the sport fish, because we did tag um, uh, brown trout and mountain white fish as well, we use 12 millimeter tags. Again, just um, that's kind of an interesting ecological question, but we didn't think it was worth the risk of implanting larger tags in those fish. Um, so we went 12 millimeters. Yeah. Have you put any arrays in yet, Jess? Not yet. That's uh, next fall. What, what kind of tags did you use? Do you know if they were full duplex, half duplex? They were, I think, uh, half duplex to match up with the arrays that you guys have. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Excellent. <laughs> and if anybody wants those arrays, they're still sitting in my garage. We might be calling you, Corey. We definitely do. <laughs> we will be calling you, Corey. Yeah. Yeah, we will. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the pod right now is uh, four arrays because I think there's, um, if like, two that the Northern Lights has, one Trout Unlimited and then one coming from AEP. And the one coming from AEP is kind of a, a potentially really cool setup because it's a dual antenna. So potentially we could set it up so one of the antennas are on the main channel and one's on a, you know, at the mouth of a tributary, but that's yet to be determined. Yeah, depending on the system, they're, they're a little bit tricky. It's, it's, um, it would have to be a really small antenna going on the main stem and on the tributary because there, you get the interference. So one of the antenna uh, setups that we do have is is a multi-array setup, but we tried to set that up in, in the uh, Dismal Creek and the, the antenna was just too large for that that system. So if it was, if they're really small, say a couple of meters wide, 
channels, that, that would be a lot uh, more efficient. Good to know. In your uh, aerial survey that you did today or yesterday, um, did you find significant groundwater inputs that were open? So, you know, I'm not sure yet. I'm actually on leave today. So I just oh. heard from my crew that they did it and it went well, but I haven't been able to dig into the data and it was just today. Oh. So yeah, next step is uh, we'll be doing, um, it, it's a cool computational step where they put the, the film with the GPS track, so you can actually see, see where you're going. So, but we'll know within the next week here. So you'd have some spots to go and look at next fall. Yeah, and, and actually earlier too, if we need to make a move on some of the remediation projects, if, um, and we'll know eDNA as well. So we'll have kind of three lines of evidence coming in to help us prioritize where we should be doing that remediation. When they did the EDNA, did they look at some of the, like the bottom ends of the tributaries just to check out like each tributary to see if there was bull trout presence or was it just more in the main stem of the tank? Hmm. Have you did, have you ever seen Christie's study design, Leslie? I don't recall, um, but I'm pretty sure it was, it was uh, all over the place. Like it was definitely not just the main stem. I think it in, included some of those tributaries as well. Yeah, at the bottom end, because then at least you'd have some better places to look at. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And, and what's kind of exciting, too, is she did it when those big bulls were moving in the system. So potentially that eDNA study could actually tell us where those bull trout moved during this last spawning run there. But again, to be determined. And eDNA is not perfect either. There's lots of reasons why it may not pick up a single individual fish moving, moving past. So, but we're very excited to see those results. Yeah, the yeah, fate and persistence of the, of the eDNA you know, is gonna be really critical. It, the, the good thing is it'll be colder water. Um, if, if they sampled actually downstream of where one of the fish spawned, then there would be a great opportunity to get uh, some of the, the DNA. But um, I, I think you said needle in a haystack before Leslie, so. I think that's kind of a similar approach. Do you know? Yeah, what the, the good thing is, from what I understand, though, is I don't think that there there needs to be like a lot of. I think water is really good at um, I don't know holding those little bits of DNA, and um, and I think eDNA works really well in an aquatic system, especially in a in a river. So yeah, I'm pretty hopeful that even if there is like little like one fish, the eDNA should be able to pick that up. Yeah, it, there's there's a few things that will impact it. So things like UV, water temperature. Yeah. Um, there's, you know, the other fish that might compound it. Um, the rate of uh, decomposition. So yeah. there, there are a few things, but yeah, I'm pretty excited. Who's doing the work? Is that Mark and uh, Patrick? Um, it is, so it's Christy Sampson and um, Steve Vimosi out of UFC. Right. Yeah, and I think it and... is, I think it is, that, um, is it Patrick Hannington from U of yeah. A that's doing the analysis? Yeah. And then I thought I heard Mark Posh's name mentioned as well. I don't think he's involved in that. Okay. Not, not in this Patrick. one, not in this one, but I know like national parks, um, they're involved in some eDNA projects too. Um, so they're all, they're all kind of working together, you know, different funding sources, but collaboratively. Yeah, we were involved in some of the work that was done in, in Banff. Yeah. So. I know everyone's uh, been harping on the nine fish. Jessica, do you, could you tell us what, like, uh, say even a low or medium risk population, what you would expect for, for spawning numbers for a run? That's a really good question. So uh, down in southern Alberta, there's been um, way more fish traps set up than in like the North Saskatchewan Red Deer North drainages. And those, like the spawning, migratory run size can really vary from less than 20 fish. Like that's what they saw in Dutch Creek. I think it was Mill Creek and a couple other places down south to, you know, 70 or 80 fish. So um, if it's a primary spawning run, you know, 
uh, 70 or 80 fish would be, you could expect something like that. If it's kind of uh, either in fringe habitat or uh, in a packed population like in the Tay, then less than 20 fish isn't unusual. That helps. Yeah, that's good. I guess that's why uh, having multiple years of that fish going to really help uh, get a better understanding. Jim, do you recall uh, how many bull trout we ended up with in uh, Chihuahua, 94? Oh, <clears throat> boy, I don't know. No, I don't, I don't, Corey, but I'm thinking we're talking in the hundreds. Yeah. Yeah, the Chihuahua, Chihuahua is a big, just for people who don't know, that's a big system in uh, northern BC, and that bull trout population looks very different than the one in the clear water, that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's a pretty big system. Yeah. Well, it sounds like we're starting to wind down on the questions. Um, I'd like to thank Leslie and Jessica for a very interesting talk about what's going on in the clear water system. And uh, it sounds like there's some great opportunities coming up for some volunteer efforts. So uh, we'd like to be. Uh, kept informed and appraised of what's going on there. And I'm uh, pretty sure there's some folks from our club that'd be like to be involved in some of that. That's great. Okay. We'll definitely keep you posted and hopefully get, you know, dates sent, dates set early and information sent out as early as we can to get people out there. Thank and thanks for having us. This was really fun. Yeah. And you guys had some really great questions. Yeah. And for sure, like if you, if you think of any other questions or, uh, you know, other concerns or anything, just fire Leslie and I an email and, and we can help you out. Um, and like, from my perspective, we're, we're so happy that the Northern Lights group here has done so much work with the Rays that we are, we are eagerly waiting to have you guys kind of mentor and train us uh, out in the Tay. So looking forward to seeing you guys out on the, on the riverside there. Sounds like fun. Thanks, Thanks again for joining us.